Investing for blessings. Does Jesus love you? Did he prove it to you? How did he prove it? He died on the cross for you. Does he want to bless you? Does he want to just pour down trickles, little trickles, little sprinkles of blessings? According to Ezekiel 34, 26, Jesus wants to shower us with blessings. In fact, there's a song about that, isn't there? There shall be showers of blessings. This is the promise of God. And we'll just end it there. You know, when the children of Israel look back on their wilderness experience, they were amazed at the ways that God had provided. Back when there was no Ralph's for beautiful decadent cakes, no Walmart, no Costco, okay? But you know, Joshua, when he was about to die, and of course he took over as the leader of Israel after Moses died, Joshua looked back on those years in the wilderness and he had to admit, notice what he says as he's dying, behold this day I'm going the way of all the earth. You know in all your hearts and all your souls that not one thing hath failed. Not one thing. Of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you, all are come to pass unto you and not one thing hath failed thereof. Not one thing. That's a pretty remarkable statement after being in the wilderness for 40 years. And beyond. Of course, he led the children of Israel into the promised land. So he could reflect on those years at all as well. Now, one of the ways that God took care of the children of Israel is found in Nehemiah 9.21. Yea, 40 years didst thou sustain them in the wilderness, so that they lacked nothing. Their clothes waxed not old, and their feet swelled not. See, God doesn't just provide more money. He can actually make things last longer than they ordinarily would. Now, why is it that your clothes are not lasting for 40 years now? Maybe he doesn't want you to dress like you did in the 70s. <laughs> you know, God just has ways of taking care of our things, making them last longer, giving us better health. You know, for years I was homeless. I was a traveling evangelist. I didn't need a home. My home was really my parents' house in Central California, but I had some of my stuff stored in a friend's barn, Jonathan Zirkel's barn. And finally he said, you know, I'm tired of all your stuff taking up my space. Can you get rid of some of it? So I went through my stuff and I noticed that the rats had gotten into my old clothes. And... Um, I was a little dis disappointed, but as I looked at it, I realized all those clothes I'd put in storage, I would never wear again anyway. What was important is that in the same area, I, there were two quilts that meant a lot to me because one was made by my mother and one was made by my grandmother. The rats got into my old clothes, but they didn't touch the quilts. Okay, so God protected what mattered. Jesus, at the end of his ministry, said unto his disciples, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked you anything? And they said, nothing. God has so many ways to provide and bless people, his people. Tonight we're going to look at some amazing promises in the Bible where God promises to take care of us. But before we get into those, I want to make a very important statement, and that is, all the promises of God are actually conditional. Did you know that? There are certain conditions that guide whether these promises come true or not. For instance, in Deuteronomy 11, God told his people, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. Now, who was it up to which was activated, the blessing or the curse? Was it up to God? No, it was up to the people. Okay? Okay. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God. How many of those commandments? Just nine, right? All ten commandments, which I command you this day, 
and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. But turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go not known. So God left it totally up to them whether they wanted to receive God's blessings or God's curses. How about you tonight? Which would you rather have, God's blessings or his curses? Okay, blessings. You're a smart audience. Did you know that forgiveness is actually conditional? It's not automatic. It's actually conditional. What does 1 John 1, 9 tell us? If, when you have a verse that begins with the word if, that's a condition, right? If we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What about salvation? Is salvation conditional or automatic? It's conditional. What did Jesus say in Mark 16, 16? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. So even salvation is conditional on us believing in Christ, which logically in our walk with him leads to baptism. Did you know that even how long you live is conditional? Of course, we've been having health nuggets because a lot of how long we live is dependent on whether we make healthy choices in our life. And I'm so thankful for Dr. Brinkerhoff and all the other speakers that he, he's been having that are helping to lengthen our life. Some of those simple tips. Now, here's a condition and promise that God gave us in Deuteronomy 5.16. There's a connection between our, the length of our life and something that I hope we all do tomorrow. Deuteronomy 5.16, Honor thy father and thy mother, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, that thy days may be prolonged, that it may be go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Some of you are grieving the loss of your mother, but you can still honor her with your life today. Or maybe other parents, you're, you're grieving. Some of you still have a mother. Are you going to do something special for her tomorrow? No. Wrong answer. <laughs> still not too late. Still not too late. You what? You have a tenth? Oh, you do it on the 10th. Okay. Well, that's fine. That's fine. Doesn't have to just be on May. I guess it's going to be what? The 8th? May 8th. You know, God promises to take care of our daily needs, which includes food and drink, clothing and shelter. Now, that doesn't mean that he's going to put you in the Taj Mahal. Or the, okay? You know, really, we don't need a lot for shelter. But you know, even this is conditional. In Ma Matthew 6, 33, what did Jesus say? Let's take a look at that verse, Matthew 6, 33. Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And what was he talking about all these things? Well, just look two verses back. Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? God knows you have basic needs. But he says, if you put me first, I'll take care of those. And you know, one of the reasons I resisted going into the ministry for so long is because I doubted these verses. Like, I, I can't leave my security. How will I ever pay my bills? How will I ever, if I ever want to get married and have children, how will I ever afford to do that? You know, it's interesting that I was single for a very long time, and it wasn't until I actually put God first that I actually found somebody. Actually, God found someone for me, right? And so, um, and God has provided in some amazing ways. Some of you sitting here tonight, you've given of your time to help us with our house. And we so appreciate that. How God provides. 
So tonight we're going to actually look at different ways that God can provide for our basic needs. We're going to actually look at 10 principles for financial help. The first principle is actually to give. What? Give? How do I get if I'm giving? In Luke 6, 38, this is another condition and promise. Jesus said, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. If you're a generous person, then you will reap generosity. If you're a stingy person, you will reap stinginess. Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Whenever I hear this verse, it reminds me of a story that happened in Brazil a number of years ago where a young lady decided to get in a car with some drunk friends. They were going to go party some more. Her mother begged her not to get in the car, but the girl refused to listen to her mother. She said, well, and her mother said, well, if you go, at least take God with you. And the girl said, well, if God's going to go with us, he's going to have to get in the trunk. That night, the car suffered a fatal crash, killing everyone on board. But inside the trunk were some unboiled eggs, undamaged. Very interesting. All right. You may not like this verse because it says the liberal soul shall be made fat. Of course, this is in a good way. You'll have plenty to eat, right? Now, it doesn't, liberal isn't talking about political, your political affiliation. It's talking about being generous, helping others, right? The wise man also says that he that giveth unto the poor shall not lack, but he that hideth his eyes shall have made shall have many a curse. Beautiful painting here by, I think, Nathan Green, about a little girl giving her sandwich to a, a man in need. So God says, you want me to take care of you? Then help take care of each other. It's a good principle, don't you think? And isn't, it, isn't there a lot of joy when you give to others? Why is it that the happiest people on earth are those that are unselfish? That give of themselves, their time, their money, their resources. Here's another financial principle, and that is to keep the Sabbath. What? The Sabbath? What does that have to do with my money? In fact, can't I, can't I get poor because I can't work on Saturday now? Remember what we read in the last hour in Isaiah 58? If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath from doing thy pleasure on my holy day... Call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of who? Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. You know, one of the things that we know about Jacob is that he became a very wealthy man. He had a great heritage. And one of the reasons why Jacob was blessed by God is because he honored God in holy things, including the Sabbath. So if you want to share in the heritage of Jacob, then like him, we should honor, the, honor God with the holy Sabbath. Amen? Another financial principle is to pay tithes and offerings. I want to share with you a very important passage in the Bible that speaks about God's blessings financially with a definite condition. And this is found at the very end of the Old Testament in the book of Malachi. Malachi 3, I invite you to turn there. Malachi 3, verses 8 through 11. This is a very important passage. Malachi 3, verses 8 through 11. Will a man rob God? Are there any robbers in the church tonight? I did a message called Robbers on the Loose. Amazingly, the next month, the tithe went up threefold. 
Robbers on the loose. You know, is there a difference, by the way, between burglary and robbery? Because sometimes people say, my house got robbed. Can your house get robbed if you're not home? No. Remember this. You burglarize buildings, you rob people. So if someone breaks into your house when you're not home or no one's home, that's called a burglary. Okay? Why do I say that? Because notice God didn't say, you stole from me or you just, you committed a burglary. You robbed me. See, robbery is very personal. It's where you take something that doesn't belong to you by fear or force from another person, from their person. Okay? So God says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, where have we robbed thee? Answer, in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you've robbed me, even this whole nation. I love how God will definitely spell out curses and the negative fallout from that, but he always gives us a silver lining. When he warns people, judgment's coming. There's also always a silver lining. Get on board the ark, because you can be saved. But yes, the flood's coming, but get on board the ark. Here, he ends with a blessing. He says, Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, food in my house. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. He shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. He's speaking to people that are farmers, right? You want your farm to do well, have good crops, then you pay your tithes and your offerings. Now notice this is one of the few places where God says, prove me, which is another way of saying, test me. God is saying, don't just take my word for it, try it out and see what happens. I want to challenge you to do that tonight. Or I want to challenge you tonight to do that. Uh, maybe you haven't been paying tithe or offerings. Maybe you're like, I can't afford to. I'm struggling just to pay my bills as it is. There's nothing left over. I want to challenge you to test God. And I would love to hear how the experiment goes. Because you'll be amazed at how God can bless you. You know, I was once audited by the IRS. It wasn't a full audit. It was an audit on one issue. And of course, no one likes getting that dreaded letter from the IRS. And during the audit, I gave it to my tax account. You know what he discovered? That the IRS actually owed us $9,000. And if they hadn't audited me, we wouldn't have caught the mistake. So I got $9,000 back. And I'm hoping that happens this year too. One time I went to Puerto Rico to pray for a, a youth conference and my luggage got delayed. So you know what happened? The airline had to pay for a new suit for me. I got a new suit, compliments of, uh, I can't remember which airlines that was. But God has ways of blessing you that you don't even realize. It's really simple. God says, look, this is really a trust relationship. God doesn't need our money, does he? He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He doesn't really need our money. What he needs is our faithfulness. And he just can't wait to bless us when we're faithful. It reminds me of my buddy Calvin. He was giving his daughter a vegetarian sausage for breakfast. And he said, Karis, would you share part of your sausage with daddy? And she looked up at him like, should I really share? You know, in the freezer, he had bundles of more. He didn't need her sausage. What he really wanted was to see if she had a giving heart. And she said, yes, daddy, you can have part of my sausage. And then, of course, he didn't take it. He just wanted to see whether she was developing to be unselfish. So what is a tithe? Tithe means a tenth, a tenth of our increase. So if you make $1,000, just do the math. How much belongs to God? 
$100. You make $100, $10 belongs to God. Now, getting back to the question, for those of you that say, I don't have enough money for tithe. I'm struggling to make it as it is. When I pay all my bills, there's nothing left over for God. You know what the problem is? You got it in reverse. What does Proverbs tell us? Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So who should be paid first? God is paid first. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. God can't wait to bless us and prosper us if we put him first. No, it's not the last fruits. Like, well, if there's anything left over. No, God, I'm going to put you first. And you know, countless people have testimonies when they put God first, how somehow they're able to pay the rest of the bills. They can't explain it with, uh, mathematically, but there's just something about honoring God and the funny math that flows out of that. Try it out. Don't take my word for it. Take God's word for it and try, test him. Try it out. Now, why is it that God can actually say that if you don't pay tithe, that it's actually robbing him? Isn't that my money? Isn't that my paycheck? Notice in Leviticus 27.30, we're told that all the tithe of the land, whether of the sea of the land or the fruit of the land, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. So actually, we're not really paying tithe. We're returning tithe. We're returning what already belongs to God. That's why he can say you're robbing me because it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. So there's a holy day during the week where God puts a claim on our time. It's called the Sabbath, which we've been talking about the last two days. But there's actually also holy money. Some of you are thinking, oh, okay, now the preacher wants to take away one of my days of the week. Now he wants to take my money away. You know what? It's not God wanting to take anything. It's he wants to give. He wants to give, but he wants us to do our part too. I like what this Baptist church said. The marquee said, give God what's right, not what's left. I remember meeting a man named Harold up in Megalia in Paradise, actually, California. He and his wife were coming to our meetings like this, the seminar. We had a seminar up there. Night after night, they were coming, and they were loving it. But then when we got to tithe, he said, I don't see why I should have to pay a tithe. I said, Harold, would you rather have 100% of your money without God's blessing or 90% with God's blessing? That stopped and made him think. And I said, you know, Let's look and see what the Bible says. I know the Bible says pay tithe. I just don't agree with it. I just don't agree with it. And then finally his wife said, Harold, why do you think we've been blessed all these years? Because I've been paying tithe. (laughs) I said, go girl. (laughs) I don't have to say a word. You know, we are told that in Deuteronomy... That thou say in thine heart, my power, the, the might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. Right? Let's not forget that all of us are stewards. It's a good thing to be a steward. <laughs> right, honey? You're a steward times two. Okay. A person entrusted with management of another's property. We are stewards or caretakers of what God actually owns. You know, everything in this world really belongs to God. Isn't that right? You know, really, God wants to be our senior partner. Now, if you want to do things on your own, it may not go so well. But wouldn't it be good to have as your partner someone that owns everything? Like this painting shows. Who's really the senior partner? Isn't that a handsome young man on the left? That's Dan's son. He has an inside track with the artist. 
Isn't this a neat painting? It's about making God our senior partner. Jesus answered, or John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Another reason that Jacob was so rich is that when he ran from his homeland, he made a commitment to God. In Genesis 28, 22, notice the commitment he made. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. He committed to becoming a faithful tithe pair, and God just continued to bless him. As his stingy father-in-law, Laban, kept trying to change his wages, the Bible says, ten times. Every time he changed the wages, Jacob just kept getting richer. Okay, I'll give you the striped lambs, knowing there's hardly any. And then they kept coming out stripes. I'll give you the spotted lambs. They kept coming out spotted. God just kept blessing. One of those reasons is because Jacob was a faithful tithe payer. Now, did Jesus affirm the practice of giving tithe or paying tithe, returning tithe? Did Jesus affirm that? In Matthew 23, 23, Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. So Jesus was saying, you know, there is something more important than being meticulous about paying your tithe. It's to uphold the law, to be righteous in your judgments, showing mercy and grace. Is it important to show mercy and grace? Yeah, because all of us need grace at times. Isn't that right? But Jesus said, you know what? Those things are important, but you should also not leave undone what you've already been doing by paying a faithful tithe. So what is tithe for? Does God have a purpose for the money we pay in tithe? Numbers 18, 21. Behold, I've given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance, for their service which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. So, you know, there was a special tribe that was assigned to do everything connected to the sanctuary, God's house. They were called the Levites. God wanted them to be freed up from having to do secular work. So he put together a system where the other 11 tribes would pay tithe with their food to feed the Levites, okay, so that they could focus on God's work. Do you think that same principle should apply today for those that do God's work in ministry? In 1 Corinthians 9, 13 and 14, Notice what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 9, 13 and 14. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And so this is affirming tithe being used to pay those that do full-time ministry. Sadly, many churches have had to resort to other means to pay the bills and pay the ministers. Some churches have bingo. Is that what God intended that we would need to pay the bills? I heard of a church in the Midwest that actually opened up a chicken restaurant to help pay the bills. And people loved the chicken. It was very prosperous. But sadly, the church eventually closed, but there's still a chicken restaurant. Somehow the priorities got mixed up, right? Here's another financial principle. And by the way, offerings is above and beyond tithe. I talk mostly about tithe. Free will offerings are according to your uh, ability. And um, I appreciate the fact that in this particular church, um, we are paid by a conference And so it's not dependent on the tithe from the individual church. Because some congregational churches, the pastor gets the tithe based on that particular congregation. So a a pastor of a big church gets a big tithe, right? To the point where they're buying homes in Hawaii and all over the place. You're like, wow. But then the small churches, the pastor could actually starve. 
So in this particular church, we're paid uniformly across the conference so that whether you pastor a big church, medium church, or a small church, it's uniform. Doesn't that make sense to do it that way? So that's what happens. Okay, so our next financial principle is to avoid debt. I'm still learning that one. How about you? Um, Proverbs 22, 7, the rich ruleth over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. And so it's true that debt is a form of slavery. Now, there may be times where it's necessary to go into debt for a house or a college education, but maybe, you know, sometimes we jump, we uh, assume that you, that's the only way you can do something and there may be other alternatives. I have a friend that went to a college actually the same college that, where Greg and Allison met. And at that time, they didn't accept, um, they weren't able to get loans for that college. But he was able to still get through school without having to go into any debt. Now, there were different ways that God provided and helped Winston get through school. All right, number five, avoid get-rich-quick schemes. If it's too good to be true, it probably is, except the gospel. The wise man said in Proverbs 28, 22, and by the way, the, the Bible has a lot of advice about money, even in the book of Proverbs. He that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. On the other hand, wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. So do it the old-fashioned way, earn it, Right? Do you know people that have been scammed for a whole lot of money because they had dollar signs in their eyes? Here's an article about a woman that it says she loses, an Oregon woman loses 400000 to a Nigerian email scam. She said it was so convincing because he was able to give me the name of a relative. So she ended up burning through her husband's retirement account drained it completely dry, thinking that this was legitimate. I knew a lady up in paradise that she, well, she was a trucker. And she did compromise by working on Sabbath a lot, saved up money. And she got taken by an email scam. Even when I met her, she'd been, she'd gotten this email like seven years before. And hey, if, you know, I have good news, the email said, um, there's a bank account with millions of dollars. Your name's on the account along with a drug dealer. And if you pay us some money, we'll get it for you. And there was always just one more thing that they had to do. And after seven years, she paid like 70 grand and still didn't have the money. And it's like, what amazed me is she still thought it was legitimate. If it's too good to be true, it probably is. What about gambling? Is gambling a sin? Bet you can't give it up. The problem with gambling is for every winner, there are many losers. So even if you win, think of all the people that have lost money to make you rich. Many of whom could not afford to part with the money. You know, my, hus my, 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 my husband, my sister <laughs> had a husband and God bless his soul, he's actually died because he was a smoker and he died young in his 50s. But the whole time they were married, he didn't contribute to the family income because he was a gambler. He worked hard. He built basements. That's hard work in the summertime in Lincoln, Nebraska. But you know what? Um, he would gamble the money away and not help with the bills. It was a disease, really. I mean, it was a... Uh, or I should say an addiction. That's a better way of saying it. it was an addiction. I once experienced gambling one night in Vegas. I was there with some friends, and my friend Dennis, who always had bright ideas that always got me in trouble, he said, look, Dave, I figured out how you can win on the roulette table. You just keep doubling the bet, and eventually you'll win it all back. Well, that's why they have limits, right? So I put $20 down black and it was red. I put $40 down black and it was red. I put $80 down black and it was red. 
$160 down on red, and it was, I mean, on black, and it was red. Finally, I ran out of money, and I borrowed from my friends. And then I, you know, I, I cleaned out my, my ATM. I got as much as I could, and I got money from them. And finally, after losing $600, they said, Dave, why don't you just call it a night? I said, I've got to get that, that original $20 back. Because I was determined to get that $20 back. Long story short, by the, you know, eventually I came back to the room. They had already gone to sleep. I, already, I came back to the room. They said, Dave, how'd you do? I said, I didn't. I lost $1,200 tonight. $1,200. And I started looking around at all the nice things there in the casinos. All the things I had bought with that money. And just for one night, I realized how horrible it must be to be a gambler. And I I realized, wow, I can see how someone can lose their house. They can lose their estate in a very short amount of time. I even saw, um, there was an article I saw this last week, a famous golfer. I think his name is Phil Mickelson. How he's lost millions of dollars to gambling. Amazing. Not part of God's plan. Number six, make wise investments. What did Jesus say in Matthew 25, 27? Matthew 25, 27. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury or interest. Okay, there is a time and a place for investing money. There's also a time and place to save money. The wise men said there in Proverbs 21, 20, there is treasure to be desired in oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man spendeth it up. It's important to, to save. What about this? Be content. And it, this goes along with what Dr. Earl sh- shared earlier, have gratitude. Be thankful for the things that you have instead of always having to have more. Now, is it okay to have a certain amount of ambition? Sure it is. Ambitious people get things done, right? Are we thankful for the companies that employ lots of people and produce products we like to use? Of course we are. But is there a limit to being ambitious? Because if you have too ambitious of a spirit, then you'll never have enough. Isn't that right? When you're a millionaire, that's not enough. When you're a billionaire, that's not enough. When you're a trillionaire, and it goes on and on, right? The Bible tells us to be content. Notice what we learn in Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Book of Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness. What is covetousness? Wanting things you don't have to impress people. You don't even know. With money you don't have. Be content with such things as you have, for he hath said, I will never leave you nor forsake thee, so that they may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So have you heard the story of the Mexican fisherman? There was once an American investment banker that went to the pier of a small coastal Mexican village where he saw a small boat with just one fisherman docked. Inside the boat, the banker noticed several large yellowfin tuna. And so he complimented the Mexican on the quality of his fish, and he said, how long did it take you to catch him? The Mexican replied, only a little while. The American then asked, well, why did you not stay out longer and catch more fish? The Mexican said, well, with this, I have more than enough to support my family's needs. The American then asked, what do you do with the rest of your time? The Mexican fisherman said, I sleep late. I fish a little. I play with my children, take siesta with my wife, Maria. I stroll into the village each evening where I play guitar with my amigos. I have a full and busy life. The American scoffed, well, I have a Harvard MBA, and I can help you. You should spend more time fishing. And with the proceeds, you should buy a bigger boat. With the proceeds from the bigger boat, you should buy several boats. Eventually, you would have a fleet of fishing boats. 
And instead of selling your catch to a middleman, you would sell directly to the processor. Eventually, you would open up your own cannery. You would control the product, the processing, and the distribution. You would need to leave this small coastal fishing village and move to Mexico City, eventually Los Angeles, and then New York City, where you will run your ever-expanding enterprise. The Mexican fisherman asked, but how long will all this take? To which the American replied, about 15 to 20 years. What then? Asked the Mexican. The American laughed and said, that's the best part. When the time is right, you will announce an IPO, initial public offering, and sell your company stock to the public, and you will become very rich. You will make millions. Millions? Then what? The American said, then you will retire. You will move to a small coastal fishing village <laughs> where you can sleep late. You could fish a little and by now play with your grandkids. Take siesta with your wife, stroll to the village in the evenings where you could play your guitar with your amigos. Be content. At some level, be content with what you have. Amen? Okay, number nine. This is a, I know this is a, a real stunner tonight, but work. Work. Did you know that even before sin, man worked? In Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man, Adam, and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. That took some work. Isn't it satisfying to put in a good day of work and feel like you, you actually accomplished something? And actually, vacations mean a lot more when you work to earn it. Remember the fourth commandment that also tells us to have a Sabbath day rest? It actually says, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. So it's not just a command to rest, it's a command to work. Jesus worked as a carpenter during the first 30 years of his life, didn't he? And then he was in ministry for three and a half years. The wise man says that he that becometh poor, that he, that he becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. So it's really not rocket science. If you're lazy, you'll probably be poor. The reverse is also true. And you know, Paul had some pretty strong statements in Thessalonians and Timothy. 2 Thessalonians 3.10, Paul said, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. He also said in 1 Timothy 5.8, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Finally, number 10, lay up treasure in heaven. In Luke 12, 16 through 21, let's take a look at two more passages here. Luke 12, 16 through 21. Luke 12, 16 through 21. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build up greater. There will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, have you ever called yourself that? Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall these things be which thou hast, which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Are we just laying up treasures for ourselves? Or are we actually investing in God's work, in God's cause? I'm thankful that a number of people contributed to make these meetings happen, actually. I mean, we sent out 50,000 flyers. Some of you benefited by receiving one of those in the mail. It's amazing how many people don't come, but we are thankful for the ones like you that did come to these meetings because God brought you here. But of course, that, that takes money, doesn't it? But because people sacrificed to make these meetings possible, you got a flyer in the mail. 
because someone cared about you and they care about growing God's kingdom. Now notice what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, 19 through 21. We're still talking about investing in heaven. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Jesus said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I remember hearing these words years ago at a prayer meeting. And I was convicted to go be a missionary just based on those three verses. Because, you know, there's only two things that we can take with us for eternity. And that's our character and other people. Those things are eternal. That's why I get so much more joy out of being a preacher than a prosecutor. Because before I was filling the prisons. Now, God said, I want you to fill heaven. Now, I don't do it. But doesn't the Bible say, how will they know if there's not a preacher to tell them? The good news is that Jesus loves them. Jesus loves you. Jesus said, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? I'm thankful for what Jesus has done for me. Are you thankful for what he's done for you? And are you investing your time, your talents, even your finances for God's cause? Something to think about, isn't it? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That includes investing in the things of God. And so I want to challenge you to put God first in every part of your life, including in your finances, and you will see how he blesses you and prospers you. Praise the Lord for that. Let's close with prayer tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you care about every aspect of our life, even our bank, bank accounts. You know, we have bills, sometimes mounting bills that seem to crush us. But Lord, I pray that we would put you first and watch you take care of our financial needs and problems. And Lord, may these verses, these promises we read tonight come true for us personally and in our families that there will be not room enough to receive all the blessings you have in store for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Just remember, pretty much everybody I've met that says I've got financial problems, when I start exploring, I find out they're not paying a faithful tithe. Imagine what would happen if we, that God will turn that around. Amen? Amen? So chess God, try him out, and we'll see you tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. Mothers, we honor you. We hope that you have a wonderful Mother's Day, and we hope you can top it off by coming and spending it with us in the evening at 6 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you so much. Have a good night.